While Europe is debating the assisted suicide of the transatlantic economy, and the President of the United States is busy trying to cover up a botched job arming narco-terrorists and justifying his fetish for extraterritorial assassinations, China and Russia are seeking allies that are serious about ensuring that civilization advances. A clear line has been drawn between the transatlantic nations that seek to hold on to their bankrupt system, whether or not that means world war, and the pro-development Pacific-oriented nations that seek genuine progress. Russia and China have recently begun a line with kindred interests in South America to seek new development agreements. Argentine President Cristina Fernandez and her counterpart Vladimir Putin met at the G20 to discuss a series of important agreements around oil and gas exploration in both Russia and Argentina, as well as Russian participation in the construction of Argentina's two new fourth-generation nuclear reactors and Argentina's expertise in developing Russia's cattle industry. Russia, as well as China, will participate in the modernization of Argentina's rail system, which has been in decay since it was privatized during the neoliberal reforms of the Minim government in the 1990s. Chinese Prime Minister Wen Jiabao traveled to Buenos Aires this past week to sign similar agreements with President Fernandez on the oil and gas and rail investment. China will help finance an upgrade that includes 50 locomotives and 2,000 rail cars. China is now second in terms of Argentina's commercial partners and ranks third among investors in the country. The defense of national sovereignty and scientific progress by the leaders of the still developing and proud nations of South America and Asia was also strongly expressed at the recent Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. On June 20th, the opening day of the conference, the Argentine Undersecretary of Planning and Environmental Policy, Silvia Revora, gave an interview to 23 magazine in which she stated Argentina's clear opposition to the global green economy agenda. We say no to the imposition of a green economy and yes to sovereign development in which we control our resources on the basis of our reality. On the closing day of the summit, Bolivian President Evo Morales denounced the concept of the green economy as another insidious form of colonialism. He warned other nations to protect their natural resources through nationalization. Preceding the summit at Rio, Argentine President Cristina Fernandez addressed the United Nations Decolonization Committee, denouncing the British Empire's colonialist policy with respect to the occupation of the Malvinas and South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands, and their increasing militarization of the South Atlantic. Desde la creación de este comité se han resuelto 80 casos de ex colonias, 11 casos de fideicomisos y solo restan resolver 16 cuestiones coloniales, 10 de las cuales son originadas por el dominio en territorios usurpados por parte del Reino Unido. Y yo vengo a hablar aquí precisamente de la cuestión Malvinas. Russia's ambassador to the United Nations, Vitaly Turkin, offered strong support for Cristina's stance and called on the United Kingdom to agree to negotiations with Argentina. But as the president of Argentina is well aware, those that would flaunt their colonial possessions and threaten the world with their nuclear armaments are not apt to play by the rules. Cristina had to return early from the Rio summit to deal with an attack on her nation that soon revealed itself to be an attempted destabilization of the continent. Hugo Moshano, the Secretary General of the General Confederation of Labor, which is one of the largest trade unions in the world, had organized a trucker's strike, purportedly over demands for wage increases. Truckers stopped delivering cash to the ATMs, stopped picking up trash, shut down refineries, and stopped delivering gas, resulting in a national fuel shortage. Although the government granted the workers a 25% salary increase, the union leader called for another strike, demanding income tax relief. Argentine Vice President Boudou denounced the strike, saying, This has nothing to do with the interests of the workers. It is a coordinated attack on the country. 
It is extortion, and this government is not going to allow 40 million Argentines to be held hostage. In the southern province of Chubut, a group of hundreds of contract workers to one of the country's most important oil fields staged a violent protest. This group, which was not affiliated with the union, carried out attacks on the refinery to damage its equipment, using machines to hurl vehicles into the air, and preventing the regular workers from being able to enter the plant. Meanwhile, in Paraguay, a coup was being organized to oust President Fernando Lugo, which would succeed on the 21st of June. It began with an incident on June 15th, where the Paraguayan army was deployed to resolve a land dispute in which police were trying to evict farmers from a land reserve. Gun battles broke out and raged for eight hours, and 17 people were killed. Less than a week later, the Congress decided they wanted to oust the president over the matter. All 12 foreign ministers of UNASUR flew to Asuncion that Thursday to help resolve the matter, but the negotiations were unsuccessful. The president is given less than 24 hours to prepare and only two hours to present a defense. Although the government claims they technically followed constitutional procedures, impeachment proceedings in such a time frame can hardly be called due process. Vice President Franco, who represents the opposition, becomes the president, but the leaders of the other nations in the region refuse to recognize him as legitimate and suspend Paraguay from the Mercosur at their June 29th summit in Mendoza, Argentina. Suspender a la República del Paraguay del derecho a participar en los órganos del Mercosur y de las deliberaciones en los términos del artículo quinto del protocolo de Ushuaia. La suspensión cesará cuando, de acuerdo a lo establecido en el artículo séptimo del protocolo de Ushuaia, se verifique el pleno restablecimiento del orden democrático en la parte afectada. La exposición de la República Argentina no tomar ningún tipo de sanción de carácter económico que perjudique al pueblo eh, paraguayo porque no creemos en las sanciones económicas, porque las sanciones económicas nunca la pagan los gobiernos, las sanciones económicas siempre la pagan los pueblos. It is important to note that given Paraguay's history, it is an easy target for destabilization of the region. The late 1860s War of the Triple Alliance pitted Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay against Paraguay to destroy that nation and create a strategic point of weakness to serve imperial interests. Before this war, Paraguay was the most industrialized nation in the Americas after the United States. Under the successive governments of Carlos and Francisco Lopez from 1840 to 1860, Paraguay had undergone rapid industrial growth by adopting protectionist policies and rejecting British free trade. An intensive infrastructure program was launched to modernize roads, bridges, and canals. Paraguay achieved construction of the first railroad and first iron foundry in Ibero-America. It was described by U.S. Consul Edward A. Hopkins in 1846 as the most powerful nation in the New World after the United States. Its people are united. The government is the richest of all the states on the continent. The war, whose clear intention was to obliterate such progress from the continent, destroyed that nation, killing 80% of the male population and almost 60% of the total population. The imperial powers that were then vying for control of the continent to seize the advancement of the then burgeoning republics of the Americas and control the rich resources of the continent succeeded in rendering the once most developed nation on the continent into a liability for the region. South America is no stranger to the cheap imperial tricks of divide and conquer. What may seem like diverse and unrelated local events are manifestations of the nefarious tactics orchestrated on the geopolitical scene. There are merely different weapons used to commit the same crime. Whether it's overthrowing democratic governments, propagating the drug trade to bail out the bankrupt financial system, or starting wars in the name of humanitarian interests, it's all part of the same historic fight, 
It's the fight for the triumph of the republic versus that of an empire. The success of human civilization will be determined by the extent to which other nations join the side of the republican fight currently being waged by such Pacific-oriented nations.